Despite the prevailing stereotypes that the Mongols of the Horde were wild and backward, this is not true. In fact, many of the things that now seem wild to us were so bold and progressive for their time that no enlightened Europe was even close. Laws of Yasa in the Legal Regulation of the Life of the Mongols The Code of Laws of Yasa, according to which the Horde lived, was developed by Genghis Khan and adopted at the Kurultai, an analog of the Parliament of the Supreme Council. Despite the apparent bloodthirstiness and savagery, upon close examination these laws unexpectedly show that the Mongols could have been one of the most honest and decent people in the world. For example, such a crime as horse-stealing was generally absent in the Horde in principle. At the same time, of course, many laws look extremely cruel and wild. For example, for the murder of the Horde ambassador, the entire tribe of the entire city or any settlement where the murder was committed was liable to death. On the other hand, during campaigns, those cities and states that surrendered to the Mongols voluntarily were subject to mercy. In internal relations, a fairly small part of the crimes was punished by corporal punishment. According to the laws of the Horde, it was considered unworthy to physically mutilate a person. The main types of punishment were three – contempt for minor offenses, exile for more serious one, and death. Death was punishable for murder, cowardice, sodomy, robbery, betrayal, witchcraft, buying up stolen goods, and even disrespect for elders and the poor. The Horde did not stand on ceremony with unfaithful wives and husbands, spies, false witnesses, and even those who allowed themselves to insult others. In other words, all vices were punishable by death, regardless of status and position. During the hostilities, failure to comply with an order, failure to appeal to the Khan, loss of weapons, and failure to help a comrade were punishable by death. Surprisingly, if someone got stuck between the debaters or spied on someone, these violations were also sentenced to death. The Mongols punished especially severely for the theft of a horse or even horse harness. In this case, the criminal was divided into two parts after death. Execution of sentences also look wild for a modern person. Firstly, anyone who convicted the criminal was obliged to punish him, and the very evasion of punishment was equated to a crime. For example, if you did not execute a thief at the market, then you yourself become a thief and will be punished in the same way as this criminal. In some cases, it was allowed to pay off the punishment, but only sufficiently wealthy Mongols could afford it. The ransom from death was worth 40 gold coins. For the Chinese one donkey and for the theft of a horse or theft in general, it was possible to avoid punishment by returning the victim 10 times the cost. If there is no enough money, it was possible to pay off with children. If the proprietor had no children either, he was simply slaughtered on the spot without any ceremony. Laws of Yasa for the Preservation of Life and Health Again, today it will seem wild, but any desecration of a water source was punishable by death, even if the water was running. This is, though, quite understandable, to a very thrifty attitude to the water, which often had a price more expensive than gold. Everything depended on water for the Mongols, and not only for them. Therefore, death was waiting for washing clothes in running water or sending natural needs into the water. Just as in the case of water, the Mongols severely punished those who dared to urinate on the ashes of the fire, for this death was counted without options. By the way, many laws at first glance quite cruel were actually aimed at preserving the health and life of the subject of the horde. It was forbidden to bathe or wash clothes in running water during a thunderstorm. And it was also strictly forbidden to scoop water with bare hands. And this has understandably helped to reduce the spread of various diseases. Yasa was categorically concerned about the safety of troops, forbidding to take food from the hands of a stranger until they themselves tasted it, which also was quite logical. Finally, before reaching the age of 40, the use of strong alcoholic beverages was totally prohibited. But even here, there were some laws which could seem strange and wild for us. For example, it was forbidden to slit an animal's throat under the penalty of death. The only way to kill an animal for food was by cutting open the chest and tearing out the heart. Only after that was it allowed to cook it for food. 
a law was associated with Asian beliefs which categorically forbade crossing the fire on which food was cooked, as well as stepping over a dish with food. But the worst awaited those who choked on food during the meal. They were ordered to immediately put to death. Yasa Laws on the Army, Economy and Relations For many people today, for obvious reasons, the law on universal military duty will seem strange. However, evasion of conscription was punishable by death. If for some reason a man could not pay his military duty, he was obliged to work for the horde for some time for free. By the way, for looting, the punishment was also death. The troops had the right to share the booty only after the battle, and Yasa even clearly described what percentage goes to the state treasury, what to the military leaders, and how much remains for ordinary soldiers. In fact, it was forbidden in the horde to enrich themselves at the expense of trophies more than other warriors. And despite this seeming savagery, the following provision of the laws of the horde actually testified more to an incredible development in every sense. It was forbidden to say that something was unclean, because everything is equally pure, regardless of the way it was received or existed. One of the most amazing was the law of unsuccessful traders. If a merchant of that time bought goods three times and each time went bankrupt, then he was sentenced to death. On the one hand, this is wild. But on the other hand, think what according to such laws would wait today bankers if they left their depositors without funds. By the way, it was the Mongols in the Horde who first introduced a progressive scale of taxation. The tax was taken not fixed, but as a percentage. That is, each person paid a tax in proportion of his own income in the amount of one-tenth. At the same time, ministers of all religious cults, doctors, scientists, legislators, and body washers of the deceased were exempted from paying the tax. Accordingly, all temples were exempted from the tax again, regardless of which god they were dedicated to. As for family and hospitality, again, many normals and ordinary things at that time seem incredible or even wild to us. For example, if a rider passed someone who was having lunch, the rider was obliged to dismount and join the meal without any invitations. It was also strictly prohibited to consume food alone, eat more than others, and start a meal without inviting somebody who was around. The Mongols in the Horde were also very strict about family relations. Every man was required to marry. At the same time, it was forbidden to marry a relative of a first and second lines of kinship. Also, children, even born from slaves, received all the rights of a citizen of the Horde and were considered legitimate heirs. After the death of the head of the family, the eldest son as the heir received full possession of all the wives and decided what to do with them, either to marry himself or to give them in marriage. Here, which is quite natural, the interest of the emperor himself was also enshrined in law. All subjects had to bring their daughters for marriage once a year so that the emperor could choose the one he liked in his own harem. It is interesting that even today lawyers are shocked by the way that Hort regulated the possession of the property of the deceased. It was forbidden for any outsiders to touch anything at all under pain of death. All property by seniority was distributed among the heirs. If there were none, then it went to those who cared for the deceased. And what is most incredible is that the property of the deceased has never been confiscated into the income of the state under any pretext. And despite the seemingly cruelty and savagery of many laws of the Golden Horde, even contemporaries admired in many ways the clear system that was built. Thus the Arab historian Ibn Battuta wrote about the Horde as follows. There were no quarrels, fights, and murders between them. They were friendly to each other, and therefore litigation between them was rare. Their wives were chaste. Robbery and theft are unknown among them.